Revenge is not the best thing to do, but in some situations, it is simply necessary, especially when it comes to a cheating spouse. When I saw my suffering daughter and decided to find out what was wrong with her and found out the reason for her bad mood, I got goosebumps. His name was Carl, Carl Montefiore. He was a tall and lean man, quite handsome with a self-satisfied expression. Even if he hadn't been involved with my wife, I likely would have felt the urge to confront him aggressively. However, in that moment, his demeanor was anything but smug. It was bewildered. When I entered his office, he believed he was meeting a potential client for his software company, not confronting a betrayed husband. He rose to greet me with a friendly smile, seemingly oblivious to recognizing my face despite our previous encounters. Good morning, Mr. Abba. Reagan, is it? Nice to meet you. Please have a seat. His handshake exuded confidence, reflecting the characteristics of a seasoned salesman. I took a seat, scrutinizing him with a cold gaze for a moment before speaking. Actually, it's not Reagan, Carl. It's Proctor. David Proctor, the husband of Lauren. Lauren Proctor from your human resources department. The woman you've been involved with for a couple of months now. His face tensed up, and he simply stared at me, unable to utter a word. I extracted a set of photographs from an envelope and placed them in front of him. Here you are with her at the Best Western Kenwood Inn on Montgomery Road, room 128, right around the back. It seems you two have a preference for the same room every time. A moment of silence followed. So who foots the bill for the room, Carl? You or my charming wife? I already knew the answer, but I was curious to see how he would respond. I'm making the payment, he stated, his gaze finally shifting past me to the distant wall. I have an arrangement with the manager there. We handle their bookkeeping and reservation software. A pause ensued. I wasn't in a rush. Undoubtedly, I was angry, damn furious, to be exact. Yet I had been harboring that sentiment for nearly five weeks, so there was no urgency on my part. All right, he conceded eventually. So you're aware. What is it that you want? Suddenly he appeared older, as if the vitality had drained from him. What do you need from me? Out in my car, Carl, there's a sizable Manila envelope addressed to your wife's office. I intend to swing by the FedEx office right after leaving here, unless I receive significant cooperation from you during our meeting. His face paled, but he restrained himself from leaping out of his chair. In a peculiar way, I admired his composure. I don't. It would be pretty bad if Emily found out about this. He met my gaze. What are you asking me to do? I slid a sheet of paper toward him. Review this. Then call my wife immediately and have this discussion with her. You can tweak the wording. Change whatever affectionate term you use with her. Whatever makes it sound natural, like she'd expect you to sound, but convey the message just as I've written it. He studied it carefully, then glanced up. I'm not sure if Lore, if she's going to agree to this. I chuckled. Carl. I've listened to the recordings of several of your intimate gatherings with my wife. Your activities were far more adventurous than what I witnessed. He blushed upon hearing that I had heard their interactions. After contemplating for a moment with a furrowed brow, he asked, And if I agree to this, what happens then? I nonchalantly replied, Then you're free from my involvement. Whatever you and Lauren choose to do, I couldn't care less after today. Concerned about the FedEx envelope meant for his wife, he inquired, and what about that FedEx envelope for my wife? Once again, I shrugged. I'll discard it. Can I trust you on that, Mr. Proctor? He questioned. Leaning forward, I asserted, you're not in a position to negotiate, Carl, but yes, you have my word. After reviewing my terms once more, he looked back at me. Seeing no change in my demeanor, he sighed and reached for the phone. Lauren and I, it's a familiar tale. No need to dwell on it. Our paths crossed during her college days and my initial venture into the workforce. It all began with a blind date, orchestrated by my cousin Marie, who was confident that we'd click. And indeed we did. Our courtship followed the standard script, but that didn't make it any less remarkable. I found myself smitten with Lauren around our fifth date, and she reciprocated those feelings. Initially, our intimate moments were a bit tame, a touch cautious, but as we opened up to each other, 
things only improved. After approximately 14 months, we tied the knot, with Marie as her maid of honor and my brother Bobby as my best man. Tina came into our lives quite unexpectedly, a delightful surprise. She's a tennis prodigy, an excellent student, and a gifted artist, a vibrant, lovable girl whom I cherish. Lauren and I used to jest that we only had one child, but she turned out to be the absolute best. I would have confidently declared that Lauren and I shared a wonderful marriage and a fulfilling life. I often did whenever someone inquired about us. Occasionally, Lauren displayed a hint of flirtation with friends at gatherings, but she consistently reassured me afterward. Our intimacy thrived, particularly after social outings where she confirmed her allure to others. Throughout 19 years, I never doubted Lauren's dedication to our relationship. No suspicious signs, no ambiguous glances, no hastily rushing home or unexplained late nights at work, and certainly no telltale marks on her body. Our level of intimacy remained constant. I was blissfully unaware. In hindsight, perhaps Lauren was a tad happier that spring, a touch livelier and more fun. Yet it was subtle, almost imperceptible, something I would have never noticed if not for the revelation of her affair. Tina was the first to discover the unsettling revelation. This added another layer of distress to an already difficult situation. It happened on a Saturday afternoon in early April during her senior year. While assisting my brother in moving some furniture, Tina had to be away for the entire day due to a tennis tournament. However, the previous day's heavy rain had led to court flooding, resulting in the cancellation of the tournament. Around 11 a.m., a few hours before Tina's expected return home, her teammate Avery drove her back. Upon arriving, Tina casually dropped her bag, retrieved a Diet Coke from the fridge, and reached for the phone to discuss the evening's party plans with a friend. Unaware that her mom was trying to call, Tina pressed speakerphone and was confronted with a man's voice uttering inappropriate comments. Shocked, she promptly turned off her phone. After a brief moment, Tina discreetly walked down the hallway and peeked into the master bedroom. There, she found Lauren lying on the bed clad only in panties. One hand was idly exploring herself while the other held the phone. Tina overheard her mother saying, Oh yeah, baby, I can't wait either. Can we meet on Monday this week or will I have to wait until Wednesday to see this beautiful big solid instrument? Moving away from the entrance, Tina retreated to the kitchen grabbed her tennis bag, and left the house. She strolled to the playground at the nearby elementary school, where she sat and cried for two hours. Afterward, she composed herself, wiped her face, and made her way back home. For almost two weeks, I was unaware of the situation. All I observed was that Tina seemed withdrawn, gloomy, and sullen. Traits not typical of her sunny and cheerful nature. Concerned, I approached Lauren to inquire if anything was amiss, but she, like me, was puzzled. It wasn't until Tina finally confided in me during our ride back from the sectionals that I learned the truth. She had performed much worse than usual, losing to a girl from Lachlan High School, whom she had defeated four times in the past two years. It was evident that she wasn't herself. Taking a detour to a nearby Starbucks, I purchased something for each of us at the drive through then parked the car in the expansive lot of a nearby Walmart. Turning to Tina, I asked, Baby, tell me what's going on. She simply shrugged and replied, Nothing. I played lousy, that's all. I leaned over and gently placed my hand on her shoulder. Tina, you know I'm not bothered about the tennis match. It's just a game. But you've seemed unhappy for the past few weeks. Please open up to me. Talk to your old dad who cares about you. I paused, understanding that Tana couldn't handle the silence, a lesson learned over the years. She gazed out of the window, motionless. Suddenly, tears rolled down her cheeks. Without turning her head, she uttered, Daddy, Mom is being unfaithful. What? I was on the brink of shouting that it was absurd, insane, asking if she was out of her mind. However, I restrained myself, bit my tongue, and patiently waited. Eventually, she divulged the entire story, coming home early, what she had overheard and what she had witnessed. Naturally, I found it incredibly challenging to accept. While I believed Tina's words, comprehending their implications was beyond me, we shared a tearful moment, after which I requested her to keep the secret, 
while I investigated further. Tina and I forged a sort of agreement, a private pact to conceal our suspicions and emotions from Lauren. Surprisingly, this ordeal brought us closer, despite our already strong relationship. Following the typical response of someone in my position, I invested a significant sum in hiring a private investigator. Three weeks later, I received the report, along with photos and audio evidence. On a Thursday, I went to work, secluded myself in my office, muted the phone, and confronted the truth. I read and listened to every detail, experiencing a range of emotions from tears and curses to physical expressions of frustration. I even threw a shoe, inadvertently knocking my framed college diploma off the wall. Afterward, I took a late lunch at a diner, contemplating my next steps over a Reuben sandwich and two cups of coffee. Although our married life appeared ordinary, it held immense significance for me. I had passionately loved Lauren for nearly two decades, never doubting my luck in marrying her. We shared a deep connection, enjoyed each other's company, and aligned in our values and life aspirations. I considered us the happiest couple in the strongest marriage I knew. Guess that wasn't the case, huh? After reviewing the private investigator's report, I realized our relationship was over. I might have been able to move past a short-lived affair, but it became evident that she and Carl Montefiore had been enjoying each other's company for weeks. It was clear that both of them took great pleasure in their relationship. Their intimacy had progressed far beyond a mere physical connection, extending well past the initial stages of passion. They engaged in various activities, such as dressing up in provocative lingerie, using toys, and exploring playful scenarios with blindfolds and handcuffs. The level of excitement surpassed anything that had occurred within our own bedroom. One day, I decided to pick up Tina early from school, and we went out for lunch together. While sparing her the explicit details, I disclosed that it was a genuine affair, and that I intended to end my relationship with her mother. Tina reacted with anger and distress. She wanted to confront Lauren immediately, but I managed to calm her down. Listen, sweetheart, you know your mother loves you. She adores you. What she did wasn't aimed at you. It was directed at me, perhaps not intentionally to cause me pain. I'm sure she thinks I'll never find out, but she betrayed me, not you. And it's my responsibility to handle it. Do you think you can maintain a facade for just a few more weeks? Be a typical daughter. Avoid anything out of the ordinary, at least until after graduation. She nodded reluctantly. I suppose so, Daddy. I mean, if that's what you want. It's just that. She began to sniffle once more. It's just that. How could she do this to you, to us? You're so good to her. And her voice trailed off into tears, and I walked around to her side of the booth, embracing her as she wept. Ultimately, Tina pledged to play the role of the loving daughter until her high school graduation. Three days later, she was headed to a 10-week junior development tennis camp in Colorado. And then after a week at home, she would be off to USC. I explicitly communicated to her my intention to terminate the marriage once she departed for the summer. Afterward, I planned to take a break and travel, sweetheart. What do you think about me spending a few days in Denver and visiting? She sniffled wiped her eyes, attempted a smile, and replied, Sure, Daddy, that sounds wonderful. I had taken care of all the necessary preparations in advance. I secured an apartment, sorted out financial matters regarding credit cards and our checking account, and arranged for time off from work to fly out to the West Coast. On the morning Lauren left for work, I waited for the movers to pick up my share of the furniture and transport it to my new apartment, along with my clothes, computer, and other belongings. After that, I had a pleasant visit with Carl Montefiore, as I've mentioned before. Following that, I grabbed some lunch and dropped off an envelope for Mrs. Montefiore in the FedEx box near the courthouse. Did you really think I would keep my word to that jerk? especially after he had been involved with my wife for weeks. At 1.45, I parked my car behind a restaurant across the street from the Best Western, found a concealed vantage point, and observed. Lauren arrived, parked in front of room 128, went to the main office, returned shortly after, placed a keycard under the mat outside room 128, used another to let herself in, and closed the door behind her.
She carried a shopping bag, leading me to assume she had brought everything Carl had requested in their recent phone conversation. I waited for about 10 minutes, then casually walked to the door, retrieved the card from beneath the mat, and entered. There she was. Lauren, my wife. The woman I'd loved and remained faithful to for two decades. She lay on the bed, adorned in a seductive black teddy and nothing else. Positioned on her stomach, two pillows supported her hips, exposing her intima diaria. A sleep mask covered her ease, rendering her oblivious to the surroundings. As the door opened and closed, she tensed. Carl, oh, you startled me, baby. I was just lying here, and, Shay, I whispered, approaching the bed to speak directly into her ear. You're quite the naughty one, aren't you? My little peach, a term he used in some recordings I had come across. No idea why. I had applied a touch of Carl's cologne, ensuring she wouldn't suspect my identity. Now that I'm here, I'm going to drive you wild. I maintained a hushed tone, confident she wouldn't recognize me. Without further ado, I located a shopping bag on a chair and retrieved the handcuffs, securing Lauren's hands above her head before producing a lengthy rope from my pocket. Securing one end to the handcuffs, I lowered the remainder of the rope beneath the bed. Moving around, I retrieved it from the opposite side, brought it up, and fastened the other end to the handcuffs on that side. Employing two shorter lengths of rope, I bound one end of each to her ankles and the other to a bedpost at the foot. Now immobilized in the center of the bed, she couldn't lower her arms, sit up, bring her legs together, or roll over. You've been naughty, haven't you? I murmured. She giggled, and I playfully swatted her bikes. It caused her to startle, and she let out a squeal. My strike wasn't forceful, certainly not reflecting the anger I was harboring. Oh, absolutely, sweetheart, I have a naughty side. Do you plan to reprimand me? She grinned, lifting her exposed rear off the bed and teasingly moving it around, enticing me. Without uttering a word, I undressed and placed my clothes on a chair near the door. Then, in silence, I waited, knowing she was unaware of my whereabouts. Carl? Darling? She sounded thrilled but a bit apprehensive. Making her wait a couple more minutes, I let her call out to me, or him, I suppose, a few more times. Unexpectedly, I began delivering firm swats to her buttocks, administering twenty alternating smacks on each cheek. Oh, Carl, what? That, ouch, hurts, darling, what? After I finished, she simply exclaimed, Damn, darling, that hurt. What on earth was that for? I reclined over her, pressing myself against her backside and softly spoke into her ear. You're quite naughty, aren't you? A little minx? A woman who strays from her spouse? She scowled and reminded me. Don't bring him up, remember? Disregarding her request, I persisted. Imagine if he caught you in this situation, sweetie. Bound to the bed, your intimate areas exposed for me. What would he say? Enough, baby, Lauren pleaded. Just, just touch me, okay? Make love to me. In a hushed tone, she added, I know I'm being bad, baby. Be my stern man and discipline me. And so I did. I carried out my plan to discipline her, fully aware that it would be the final occasion I'd lay hands on her, the last time I'd witness her undressed. I positioned myself between her parted legs, indulging in kissing and caressing, until she reached the point of breathlessness, her hips writhing in response. Just as she teetered on the brink of climax, I deliberately halted. It's important to note that this was someone I had been intimately involved with for two decades. I was familiar with her reactions, and I timed my actions with precision. You rascal, she exclaimed. Complete it, please, baby. Ignoring her pleas, I observed as she moved her hips as if coaxing my tongue back, allowing her to regain composure before resuming. Repeatedly, I repeated the process each time with a slower, gentler pace. By the third instance, Lauren was covered in sweat, uttering pleas and gasps, desperate for release. Please, Carl, please, baby, let me climax. Please, you've driven me so wild. Unexpectedly, I relocated to the head of the bed, directing my semi-erect member toward her face. I teasingly brushed it against her cheeks until she eagerly opened her mouth to receive it, moaning and swirling her tongue around the tip. I brought it out briefly, 
whispering, Do you enjoy this, darling? Is my instrument to your liking, my little companion? Does it surpass Dave's? Without waiting for her response, I returned it to her mouth, causing her to struggle a bit. I allowed her to attend to me, at times reclining passively and at other times moving my hips rhythmically for a deeper connection. Occasionally, I leaned down to give her already reddened buttocks a playful slap just to lift her spirits. When my arousal peaked, I withdrew from her mouth, circled around her from behind, ascended onto the bed, and entered her moistened intimacy. Oh, darling, she sighed. I positioned myself on top, pressing her onto the pillows, relishing the warmth of her intimate embrace, perhaps for the final time. Then, without uttering a word, I began the intimate act. I wanted to give Lauren something to remember me by, so I caressed her slowly and hard, intending to make her enjoy herself a few times before I was done. When I finally finished, I just collapsed on her back. There was silence. Maybe I was squeezing the breath out of her a little bit, but I didn't care. Finally, she said in a little girl's voice, It was amazing, baby. You surpassed yourself today. She giggled and added, What got into you? Or should I tell you what came over me? I got up and, without saying a word, started getting dressed. She had a dreamy smile on her face. She looked very pleased with herself. That was amazing, Carl, she repeated. When I remained silent, she inquired, Baby, Carl, where are you? Fully clothed, I resumed my place on the bed beside her. Right here, sweetheart. I reassured her in my own tone, removing the sleep mask from her face. Her eyes blinked open and she greeted me with a slightly bewildered smile as her vision adjusted. Then she exclaimed, Oh! A brief, abrupt sound that was quickly stifled. I observed her, and her expression transformed into one of terror, with wide eyes and a frightened grimace. I had a plethora of furious words at the ready, week's worth of anger and despair I was prepared to unleash upon her. But instead, I chose silence, merely observing her face as she processed the events of the past two hours in that motel room. Lauren grew visibly pale. Nervously licking her lips, she stared at my stoic expression. David, I... Oh my God. David, I can't fathom what you... Honey, it's not. I mean, it wasn't what. She couldn't complete a sentence, which was perhaps not surprising given the circumstances. I silently regarded her as tears began to stream from the corners of her eyes. She lay there, unclothed except for the bunched-up teddy around her chest, perspiring with evidence of intimacy evident, hands bound above her head. She started to cry, shaking her head, still looking at me but shaking her head, repeating, No, no, it's not. You can't. It's not. I rose from my seat, observing her in silence as her sobbing intensified. Without uttering a word, I retrieved a prepaid cell phone and dialed a pre-programmed number. Upon hearing the voice on the other end identify as the eyewitness news tip line, I quickly relayed the distressing situation. Yeah, I'm currently at the Best Western Kenwood on Montgomery Road, and there's some kind of domestic dispute or inappropriate activity occurring in the adjacent room. Room 128, I informed. Without waiting for a response, I ended the call. Lauren had ceased crying, fixing a horrified gaze on me as she twisted her head to look up. No, baby, please. Don't let them, don't let anyone see me, please, baby. I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to hurt you. Please, Dave. Maintaining eye contact with her, I dialed the phone again. 911. What is your emergency? Inquired the voice on the line. Yeah, I'm at the best Western Kenwood and there's a man engaging in inappropriate activities with a woman in room 128. The door is wide open, and you can see everything. I walked by with my kids, and my God, he has her restrained on the bed and everything. I abruptly ended the call. Lauren's cries grew more frantic as she twisted in an attempt to free herself. Please, baby, please, please, you're not going to leave me here. I'm begging you, please. I crouched down, placing my hand over her mouth and securing her face tightly to prevent any attempt to break free. Her eyes reflected panic as she gazed back at me. I maintained this grip for a couple of minutes, simply observing her, the woman I had loved for the majority of my adult life.
Eventually, I released my hold on her and exited the room, disregarding her desperate cries and pleas echoing behind me. Using a cushion from the couch, I propped the door wide open before stepping into the parking lot. I settled on a bench near the street. Approximately four minutes later, a large eyewitness news van pulled into the lot. I waited until I spotted two individuals, one carrying a sizable camera, heading towards the open door of room 128. At that point, I crossed the street, entered my car, and drove away, indifferent to the continued pleas fading in the distance. Lauren restrained on the bed, the news crew entering the room, and the police on their way. There's always an aftermath, whether one prefers it or not, unless someone is dead, I suppose. Then there's no aftermath for them, at least. It was a mid-September Saturday, and I was driving back to the house, the one Lauren, Tina, and I used to share. However, now I resided in a downtown apartment. Tina was in her USC dorm, and the house was on the market since Lauren couldn't afford the mortgage alone. Following my marriage-ending escapade with Lauren, I flew to San Francisco for my vacation, visited my brother, drove through the Rockies, and had a wonderful time with my daughter. Upon returning home, I embarked on building a new life, that of a single guy. I had my lawyer initiate the divorce proceedings and deliberately avoided any communication with Lauren, except for leaving a message stating that she had until November 1st to buy my share of the house. Otherwise, I would sell it. Despite her calls and emails for weeks, I remained unresponsive. There was nothing I wanted to say to her and nothing I wanted to hear either. I had a friend monitor the media coverage of my little adventure. It garnered a few articles in the local newspaper, unfortunately no photographs, and three days' worth of suggestive stories on the local eyewitness news channel at Eleven Aliens. They managed to capture some footage, the camera approaching the open door of the motel, followed by a partial shot of a restrained woman on a bed. Regrettably, there were no images of Lauren's face, and the news station deliberately avoided mentioning any names, presumably to sidestep potential legal issues. Oh well. Meanwhile, Mrs. Montefiore was going after her husband, creating enough commotion at the company to get Lauren terminated. Among our friends, the identity of the anonymous lady in that peculiar motel room incident had become known, and that sufficed for me. Lauren had to take an administrative job 20 miles away with a reduced salary. I was aware that she wouldn't be able to maintain the house. According to Tina, Lauren had been miserable and apologetic during the entire week that Tina was back before leaving for college again. Tina was still so upset that she could barely bring herself to talk to her mother. I drove into the driveway, parked, and entered the house. Lauren had agreed to sign the divorce papers and grant power of attorney for the house if I would come to talk to her. She sat at the kitchen table sipping coffee and observing me as I walked in. Hello, David, she greeted quietly. Lauren? She appeared older, slightly diminished. It seemed like she hadn't been sleeping or eating well. I didn't feel an abundance of sympathy in my heart. Would you like some coffee? No, thanks. I poured myself a glass of water and took a seat. She nodded toward the counter, saying, The papers are all there. I've signed them. How much time do I have before I need to find a new place? Probably at least two, three months. Even if it sells right away, people usually require a couple of months before closing. I'll keep you informed. A moment of silence ensued. I understand that we're finished, she suddenly expressed. I've dedicated a considerable amount of time pondering this, as you can probably imagine. Aside from questioning my own foolishness, I contemplated how I would feel if the tables were turned, if you were having an affair behind my back. I couldn't fathom the idea of taking you back under any circumstances. The sense of betrayal, the shock, humiliation, and the anger from being deceived and treated with such contempt. She looked at me, unhappy yet with dry eyes. I'm trying to convey that I comprehend, David, or at least I somewhat understand. I won't assert that I can truly grasp what you've been through. If there were any chance, any way at all you cooled, I don't know, find a way to give me another chance. I would do anything, give you every ounce of devotion and love within me to make up for what I've done. But I don't expect there's any possibility of that. Her eyes flicked up to glance at my face, but all she could have seen there was a blank stare. So what I really wanted to say is, I'm sorry.
Sorry I cheated on you. Sorry I acted inappropriately. Sorry I disrespected all the love and loyalty and support you've given me since the day we met. I'm sure my apology doesn't mean much of anything to you, but you still deserve it, and I still wanted to give it to you. She gazed at me, probably hoping I'd say something even a little bit comforting, but I didn't. I just looked back at her. No nod. No. Uh-huh. Just looked. Did Tana tell you how we found out? She nodded, her face tight with pain. I asked her several times and she finally did. I feel so terrible about that. For what it's worth, David, it was never about humiliating you or hurting you. I know I was an idiot to think I could keep it a secret, but that's what I was trying to do. We were. At least we thought we were being very careful. She started to tell me about how it had started and I put up my hand. I don't want to hear it. I don't care how it started. I don't care why you did it or how long it went on or any of that. You wanted to tell me you're sorry. Okay, you told me. Anything else? I knew I was being a cold-hearted person and it was a bit surprising that I found it so easy to do. She was suffering and I found I wasn't the least bit interested in being consoling or even decent to her. You do the crime, you do the time. And it was my marriage she destroyed, my happy life she'd blown into a million pieces. As I waited, a tear slid down her cheek. Thanks to everyone who took the time to listen to today's stories. If you enjoyed it, please consider liking and subscribing if you haven't already. Feel free to share your thoughts on the events in the comments below. Take care.